I'm going to show you the whole Bible in three minutes from cover to cover, rough overview. Ready? Look at the screens. This is what I call the mirror image of the Bible. The mirror image. Just, for you free, just follow me, okay? All right. The Bible starts in Genesis 1. We'll be done after this. God, y'all are doing good, class. You're doing good. Praise the Lord. You get a hall pass after this. God and righteous man in paradise, the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was so dope, gentlemen, if you have to water your lawn, Mr. Johnny, I don't know if you're in the service, but my neighbor, Mr. Johnny, there you go. You wouldn't even have to do yard work, Mr. Johnny. You wouldn't even know what to do in Eden. You would be like, I got to go somewhere else. You want to clip the grass because you didn't even have to have sprinklers. The weather was perfect. All of you who are like, we skipped spring and just went to summer, and you were just complaining about how cold it is. Now you complain about how hot it is. Then it was raining. I wish it stopped raining. Now it's sunny, and you could just shut up. There would be no weathermen because it was perfect. They walked and talked with God in unbroken fellowship. It was God and righteous man. But then Satan and sin enter. The way sin got in the world is through the woman and the man by making them doubt God's word, which is the same plan on why he's trying to make our generation and you doubt God's word. Because when you doubt God's word, sin can get in your life. And here's the deal. Everybody say this with me. Say sin separates. Sin separated their relationship with God. And sin separates you from God. For many of you, you walked in this room and you feel a gap between you and God. You don't understand why people worship the way they do. It's because the sin in your life has created the distance between you and God. Even if you're here and you're saved and you feel like God is distant right now, it could be that you have unrepentant, unconfessed sin in your life creating a gap between you and God. And any time there's sin in your life, here's how you can tell. Chaos ensues. When stuff don't go right, sin is all up in the mix. And what happens is sin takes the world rampant. Cain kills Abel. We got stuff going on crazy. We got people sleeping with everybody. We got homosexuality running rampant all in the Old Testament. It all goes nuts. And it goes so haywire that God has to judge the world. And he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try again to start over because the way we're headed, it'll never work for me to have my people back. So he didn't judge the world out of anger. He judged it out of love. Because if he'd have left it the way it was, we couldn't get to the Messiah, so he had to judge it. So he does something by saving a righteous man named Noah and his family. They get on an ark. Side note, Bible facts. Study what the ark is made out of and the pitch that's covered over it. And the same basket and the pitch and the type of wood that was placed in Moses with the reed in the basket. That's for you biblical scholars. Study that on your own. Uh, but the world is judged by water. Then, fast forward, in Genesis 11, we get the Tower of Babel. And the people start over, but they say, you know what? Since we can't get to God on our own, we're going to overtake God. And they build a one-world government system. As one people speaking one language with one religion with one government system, they build a tower to try to get to the heavens on their own and overtake God, which is the spirit of the Antichrist in Revelations all the way in the Old Testament. And so then God has to come down and scatter the people. And that's where we get this 12 tribes of Israel, okay? Because God wants to make a chosen people. Because down here, he was trying to let the, the, all the people get him to all the people. So he's got all these people he's trying to reach, and he thought if he left all the people, then fine. So then he says, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get one chosen people to then birth me a redeemer through the years. If they can, if they can follow me, they can point everyone to me. Side note, this is just like the church trying to be in the world, but every time the chosen people live in the world rather than and, in, and are influenced by the world, the chosen people go into captivity in the world. But every time the, the world goes to the chosen people, the world gets better. Which is why today, every time we as the church try to do it the world's way, stuff don't go right. We're not in the world to be of the world. So then the rest of the whole Old Testament is the story about God's holy people, Israel. You got Abraham, you got Isaac, Jacob, you got stuff, you got Ruth, Boaz, you got all these people. You got Esther, she's queen, she got new perfume, you got all this stuff, it's all right there. Okay? Then Malachi happens, and then the whole thing changes because of one person, and his name is Jesus. Jesus. Someone say Jesus. Jesus. And what Jesus does is he flips the script. He comes, he dies for us on the cross, he loves us. And he institutes 12 disciples. 
not 12 tribes. And he starts not a chosen people, but he starts a new chosen people called the church. And this is where we enter the story and are in the story right now. You're right here. And the church of today is supposed to do what the children of Israel were supposed to do of old, which is to take Jesus and spread him to the world to help every man, woman, boy, and girl start to know that you, can, you don't have to pay for your own sins. You don't have to do it under law, that God loved you enough that you could receive him and you could go to heaven, you can be right with God, that we're supposed to take this message to the world. But once again, because humanity is sinful, in Revelation, we are once again, through the spirit of the Antichrist, Revelation 13, we're going to try to do a one world system again. And some of you are like, what, what do you mean? Do you realize that no other generation in history has had more of the signs fulfilled of the end times than ours? One of the signs is that we go back to a one world system, which is a one government system. I don't know if you ever heard of the European Union, but you should Google what a picture of the old Tower of Babel probably looked like and what a picture of the offices of the European Union looked like. And the fact that in Revelations, it's going to talk about 10 governmental heads. And those heads are actually, we have about four to seven unions already formed within the European Union of governments. And the fact that we have stuff going on right now that has never happened before. In fact, for the, for the, for the Lord to return, one of the things that's going to happen is that there has to be satellite technology, which we have. And one of the things, you ever heard of the Mark of the Beast? The Mark of the Beast, 666, the Mark of the Beast. You ever heard of that? You know what that is? That's an economic system. That's going to be you are microchipped or something where we all buy and sell from the same Mark of the Beast. And do you know that right now, I believe it's in Wisconsin, there's a technology company that chips its employees they microchip their employees where that's how you scan into the building and out. That's how you buy and sell. Do you understand it's, it's happening? Swipe. Put your chip in. Put your phone. Pastor Brian, you're kind of scaring me. Are we in the end times? Yeah. Well, Jesus coming back tomorrow. I got to get it right. I got to go. I got to go bag that girl. I was trying to. No. <laughs> I believe we are in the end times, but the Bible says no man knows the hour. And here's the point. Whenever he comes back. It doesn't change how we're supposed to live today. And I'm going to talk to you next year about, our, is this the end? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to look at the scriptures and teach you more. But here's my point. We're closer to the end than you think. Which means it should change the way you live. And then what God does is he has to judge the world. And he destroys it this time by fire. Which means he's going to burn up everything that's not like him and it will be thrown forever into the lake of fire. <laughs> Some of you wonder, how could a loving God send people to hell? Hell is not a place where God sends people he's mad at. Hell is a place where people have decided that they, have, they are going to pay for their own sin, but they don't have to, and God doesn't want them to. but he has to let them have a choice or it wouldn't be love. If I said to Tamika, and she was the only woman in the world on the planet, and I said, girl, I love you. Of course I love you and choose you as my wife. You're the only woman that exists. But because I had a choice, I've chosen to love her. And because God judges the world and anyone who does not know and has not received Jesus will be judged and condemned to hell forever by their own choice, not the will of God. Satan and sin exit. And we, those who know Jesus and have accepted them, will live with God as redeemed persons in paradise and new heaven, new earth. Right here, some of us don't even see the importance of this because we just think this life is so great. This isn't the afterlife. This is the beginning of life. If you think this life is great and you think that you got some gold chains, you got some money down here, you walk on streets of gold in heaven. Do you understand what heaven is going to be like? There's not going to be no more sickness. There's going to be no more poverty. There's not going to be no more disease. And do I want to live life? Yeah, I want to see my daughters get married and have grandkids. I want to see all that. But you know what? I really want to see my king and I want to live forever with my daughter 
daughters and with my son, and I want to see my mama again. Can I help get her saved on her deathbed? I want to see her again, and I want to talk to Paul and ask him why he said that, and I want to talk to Eve and be like, yo, what did you do? And I want to talk to Adam, and I want to talk to God. I, want, I got some questions to ask. Why mosquitoes, God? Noah, what was up? I got some stuff, but I want to live forever. The closest word we have in our language for paradise in the revelation of the new heaven, new earth is resort. So you can take your Dominican seven-day vacation all you want, but I'm going to live forever in eternity with blue waters and blue sky. Why? Because I'm on my way, not because of what I did, but because of what he's done. And if you look at it, what started here ends here. And God flipped the script. I'm trying to tell y'all we serve a flip script in God. Because this isn't an accident. This was the plan before the foundation of the world. Jesus was the lamb slain. But then why did all this have to happen? Why did God try to do it this way? Because he had to give man every opportunity to choose him. Somebody asked me, why did Jesus let Judas stay if he knew he was going to betray him? Because a just God has to give Judas every single chance to repent or else he would not be just. And you know what a just God does for us? He's trying to give every single one of us a chance to turn to him. And here's what I want to tell you as you begin to read this Bible and hopefully that makes you just intrigued about the story. That whole story is about one person. It's the subject of the story, and his name is Jesus. So many of us say the subject is us, but it's not, it's Jesus. We are the object, but Jesus is the subject. And in fact, I want to encourage you. You want to know how to start reading your Bible? Find Jesus on every page. Well, Pastor Brian, I don't know where Jesus is. He doesn't show up to the New Testament. No, you missed it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. God, plural, Elohim. The name of God, which is the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is in verse 1 in Genesis. He's the, same. He's the fourth man in the fire in Daniel. He's the rock that gave them water in the wilderness. He's the manna that came down, the bread of life in the wilderness. He's the one, the brazen serpent in the wilderness that if you look to, he's healed. And the same one that became sin, who knew no sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And he became came the brazen serpent in the garden of Eden. He took on that sin to be the serpent in the New Testament that by his stripes we may be healed. He's the same God yesterday, the same today and forever. And you can find him on every page. He's the Passover lamb. He's the blood that was put on the doorpost. He is Jesus on every page. He's the subject. But then Pastor Brian, if the subject of the Bible is Jesus, stand on your feet. We're going to be dismissed. If the subject's Jesus, then what is the verb? Tell me real quick, what's the verb of the Bible? It's not love. You're wrong. Eh, you failed the pop quiz. I'm just playing. Listen, love is not the verb of the Bible. It is the motivation and the foundation of the verb. The verb of the Bible is not love. It's give. Because God had love and he is love, but the Bible says in Romans 5, 8, for God so loved that he demonstrated his own love and that he gave. John 3, 16, for God so loved that he gave. The verb of the Bible is give because he loves. God doesn't just say he loves you, he shows you he loves you. And he's not like all the other people in your life that say, I love you, but he doesn't show it. He shows you. And he showed you the greatest gift he could ever show you. He died for you himself in the form of his son. And here's the response that we're supposed to have to the Bible. Every time you read it, every time you hear about it, you realize that God gave. God wants you to give back to him. Not an offering. He wants you to give your life.